Good evening. Good evening. I'm Grant Gillard, pastor at New Horizons in Odessa, Missouri. But that's not the most important. Most of you all know him. Grant's my husband. Have you guys met him? You should have by now. <laughs> I think. Um, we are celebrating the uh, Lord's Supper tonight together. We're doing this for the Monday Thursday service. And really, it's a special evening for us because we rarely get to spend Monday Thursday together. Two churches, two different places. Two churches, two different places. Um, when we were first ordained, we were co-pastors at a church in Delaware. So we always got to serve together for whatever the special, special services special holiday was. Uh, but since that time, and that's been about 25 years ago, mm -hmm. we have been in separate churches for all the holidays, the holy days. So this is kind of great for us. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing typical about what we're doing tonight. I do miss being in the quiet of our own sanctuary. I do miss having the solemn spirit of my brothers and sisters in Christ at First Presbyterian Church with me, I miss you all. But since we have to be apart, can we find the togetherness of the Spirit in this holy supper, in this holy evening together? So let me ask if you would bow your heads in prayer, and we'll open with prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that even though we are apart from one another, that on this evening you bring us together. You bring us together through our families. I have Grant here with me. You bring us together through the commandment that you give us to love one another. You bring us together, Lord, as your spirit continues to teach us to share the good news of the gospel, even in times when we're not sure how to do that. But on this evening, Lord, Help us to draw near to you in a way that reminds us of the gift of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice on our behalf, and his death and resurrection. Thank you for this evening. Amen. Amen. I had asked Grant if he wanted to share a special Monday Thursday memory that he might have, so he will be sharing that with you. I like the story out of John 13, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. I've been physically part of a foot washing as part of a leadership team where we washed each other's feet as a sign of our servanthood. And of course, Jesus washes his disciples' feet to show his servanthood to them. My first instance when I saw this was in a Catholic church in Palm Springs, California. We had flown out there to visit my Aunt Marge, and Aunt Marge was a Catholic. She believed you go to church on Monday, Thursday. So we went and mostly observed because as Presbyterians we couldn't take part of a Mass. But it was unusual. And the priests washed some of the other priests' feet. They didn't wash everybody's feet. But that was my first introduction to this, this idea of foot washing. I also saw it at my niece's uh, wedding in Kansas City where her husband-to-be washed her feet as part of the, the service. As part of the wedding service. Part of the wedding service. Yeah. 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 It was just an opportunity for them to show a special love for each other and for them to say to all their friends and family that had gathered for the wedding that they would always um, imitate that love that Jesus had for his disciples by washing each other's feet in the mm -hmm. same way that Jesus did that, showing his service, showing his humility. Even though they called him Lord and Savior, he still said, you know, let me wash your feet because mm -hmm. I am also a servant. Yeah. I, I had forgotten about that. Um, that's, that is a, that's a nice memory. I guess um, one of the memories that I will continue to hold fast to is the Tenebrae service that we had just last year at the Presbyterian Church in Clinton. And particularly those different members of Clinton Church where we um, shared scripture readings, we shared interpretations, but then we continued to make the sanctuary darker and darker and darker until it really was just the candlelight 
that held any light, and then those candlelights were extinguished as well. Mm -hmm. We sang that beautiful hymn, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? And we pondered in our own hearts the depths of darkness that Jesus Christ put himself into so that we might also remember that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Uh, Grant and I have talked about a couple of different scripture readings to share for this evening, and we've chosen two, and I'm going to have him read the first one. Again, mine comes out of John 13, and when I think of Monday, Thursday, uh, it's a mandate. So Jesus gave them a new mandate to love one another. It's really not new. Uh, you know, a lawyer came up to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, well, there's two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And then the second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, the, the lawyer, the expert of the law, then quizzed Jesus by saying, well, who is my neighbor? In this uh, passage, Jesus gives us this mandate to love one another. And it's not even open to this question of, well, who is one another? It comes from Jesus, uh, John 13 and verse 31. And it says, Jesus predicts Peter's denial as the paragraph head. As soon as Jesus, as soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for me, the Son of Man, to enter into my glory, and God will receive glory because of all that happens to me. And God will bring me into my glory very soon. Dear children, how brief are these moments before I must go away and leave you. Then, though you search for me, you cannot come to me, just as I am told the Jewish leaders. So now I'm giving you a new commandment, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. As I was preparing for this evening, and particularly for the Monday Thursday sermon, I read a wonderful scripture about the importance, or a wonderful story about the importance of what it means to love one another. And one of the authors turns this idea around and says, is it possible for us to love one another if we have not yet quieted our spirit and learned to love quietly ourselves? And I know that there are several of you that may be watching this um, in the quiet of your homes, in, in your offices, or maybe um, Grant and I actually are sitting at our kitchen table um, in, our, in our home. Um, but in, unless we realize that what Jesus Christ did for us on Monday, Thursday, is certainly about loving one another. But to begin with, we have to recognize the importance of this evening being about me. It's about you. It's about each individual saying, I will dedicate my life to the one. It's about knowing that I am a sinner, that I need this special meal that Jesus gives to us by saying, I will break my body, I will pour out my blood, I will do that for you. And particularly on this evening, to ponder that and to recognize what Jesus did for me as an individual. Some of you will be seeing this and you'll be sitting with a husband or you'll be sitting with your family or you'll be sitting with a friend. But some of you will be watching this and you'll be alone. And I want you to understand that what Jesus Christ did for us, particularly on Monday, Thursday, is to say, consider your own life. This meal is not just for all the people that surrounded Jesus, the disciples that surrounded him at the table. They didn't take it as a unified group. They took it individually. And I think as the bread and the wine were passed from individual to individual, they began to understand in their own minds and hearts that this meal is for me. Jesus said, this is for you. I give it to you. And I don't, in, we lose a little bit in English because we have that you plural where we might think that Jesus is giving it for all of you. But I think that this particular meal is Jesus is giving it for you as an individual. It's a wonderful quote from a man, and his name is Brennan Manning. He's an author and he's a conference speaker, and he writes about God's love in this way. 
He said, Jesus came not only for those who skip morning meditation, but also for the real sinners, thieves, adulterers, terrorists, for those caught up in squalid choices and failed dreams, to the worst of the worst, to the one beyond hope, to you and to me, he says, a new covenant, a new commandment, I give you, love one another. And that's what grants us thread, and that's what this scripture is all about, and what this evening is all about. Jesus came for me in the midst of my sin. He came for you in the midst of your sin. And he reminds us of that so that we can beg his forgiveness, so that we can know that on the cross he does forgive us, and in that we are loved. So let me now take a time to ask you to bow your heads and to prepare your minds and hearts for this communion service. Grant, do you want to pray in uh, preparation for the meal? Okay. Thank you. God, as we break this bread and drink this wine, we pray for all those that partake of communion. We commune with you. We also commune with one another. Help us to find the commonality that we find in this bread and in this wine. We prepare our hearts that this bread and this wine would be part of that, uh, that, that sense of your love for us. We give you thanks for inviting us to this table. We give you thanks for Jesus making it possible that we receive that invitation. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The words of the institution tonight come from Mark 14 verses 22 through 26. And Grant, if you want to do this while I'm reading it, let's do that, okay? okay. All right. So while they were eating, he took the loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, Take, this is my body. And then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it, and he said, This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And I just want to mention at this point, there have been several of my friends from the presbytery that have said, How is it that we can take communion in this way because it's so unique, it's so interesting. And one of my favorite pastors in the church here at Heartland Presbytery said, you know, in the words of institution, Jesus just says, do this. In Corinthians it says, do this in rem remembrance of me. And that's all scripture says, is just do this. And so we offer on this evening this um, joyful giving of Christ or Christ's supper to one another, understanding that through Jesus Christ, we recognize that he is the resurrection and the life. So let me serve you, Grant. Grant, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. See, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is now the blood of Christ, poured out and shed for our sins. This is for you. Amen. And the cup of Christ, the cup of the new covenant. Amen. And again, let's bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, through this bread and this cup, help us, Lord, to gain your strength. Let the Holy Spirit fill us so that we might know the love of Jesus Christ and do the good work of the gospel. On this evening, Lord, we pray for those we may not be able to be with them in the church, in the pews, but we remember our friends from the Presbyterian Church in Clinton, as well as so many people in our Christian faith that celebrate the work of the Lord this Monday, Thursday. We ask, Lord, that you would be with all those that are on the front line of this disease. We'd ask, Lord, that you would be with all the first responders, the doctors and nurses, all those that are associated with caregiving, 
as well as those in research and development as they continue to search for an answer for this virus. We pray, Lord, for all those that are working in our governments. Lord, they are trying to find a solution and they're trying to keep the civil and the civilians um, safe with one another. That we would lift up and be our very best selves, even in this time when we don't understand our liberties being limited. And yet, Lord, we lift up our very best selves so that others may be safe. And finally, Lord, we lift up our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who gives his life for us, the one who raised again from the dead, so that we might know love, forgiveness, life abundant, and life eternal. And we pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and grant you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Bye.